Oh, good morning. I'm still on the South African time zone, and it's good evening. Well, we've been tremendously impacted by all the teachings from yesterday. Thank you to Jerry and to Donald. Where's Donald? Yeah, tell him to stay in the bathroom because his Greek and Hebrew is a bit dangerous. If I go into a chair, he's going to expose me. Oh, yeah, he comes. Now I have to be under pressure. But it's such a joy to share the word of the Lord with you. Um, you know, it's my personal conviction that we are living in a Kairos moment where God engages the methodology of provo provocation to challenge us. Hebrews chapter 3 says that the day of the Lord is the day of provocation, that God challenges the hearts of the fathers so that they can bring alignment to his purposes in the earth. And good, well, those who come to speak apostolically do not present sermons and messages. They're actually sowing seed into your spirits so that conception could take place. Um, and so if you're feeling uncomfortable, which we all should feel when certain very poignant statements are being made, it should force us to get back to the closet where we search the scriptures to find out whether what is being said is of God or not. If we are just comfortable with what we are hearing, um, and I'm not saying we shouldn't be comfortable because there could be resonation in the spirit where you could agree, but but if we get too comfortable sometimes, it means that the Word of God is not piercing, penetrating, and separating issues like the matters of the soul from the spirit, the marrow of the bone from the bone, and one's thoughts from one's intents. So the Word of God is extremely prov provocative, and it should challenge us to critically analyze critically analyze the systems and the structures that we've become so comfortable with. And this present season, which is referred to in some circles as the apostolic season, is seeking to bring us back to credibility, to authenticity, to originality, to how God originally designed the church to function. The word apostolic is unrelated to the word apostle, even though they belong to the same constellation of words. The word apostolic was, is not a biblical word. The word apostle is biblical. The word apostolic is not biblical. It was a word that we borrow from church history, where the, the early church after the demise of the first apostles and their sons, um, started to engage or, or encounter spurious or counterfeit or delusional doctrinal teachings in the church. And they had no point of reference because the New Testament canon of scripture was only established in the fourth century first 300 years they only had the Old Testament scriptures. That is why when people argue about tithing and first fruiting and various administrations in the church, they do so from an ignorant point of view because a lot of things from the Old Covenant was very simply absorbed by the apostles who were cradled in Judaism uh, but helped the church of the New Covenant to interpret and translate that information so that it could be incubated or incarnated into a new way of living. And, um, and so church history had to give 
very powerful seminal statements to guide the church. Uh, the Apostles' Creed, for example, said that the church is, is uh, one and not two or three. It's infinitely, indivisibly, and very peculiarly one. That wherever the church is, it should be the most manifest expression of everything God is. They also said that the church is holy, and holy had nothing to do with ethics and morality. The word holy simply means separate. For want of better words, the, 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 the word holy simply means incomparable and peculiar to its own classification. And the only comparative to the church is their God who is holy. So the church could not go to secular centers to extract models on how the church should function. Jerry used the word corporate. So you cannot go to Hollywood or Bollywood or, some, or to Wall Street or to some great consultant to borrow ideas on how you build the church. You had to go to the professor of the scriptures, which is the Holy Spirit, who would introduce you to the mind of God through the word so that designs and patterns from God's word would be implanted into the church. The church is not a hybrid. It's, the church is not a social construct. The church was not born out of the intelligence of humankind. The church is God's original design before he created the heavens and the earth. It's called election. It's called calling. It's called predestination. So when we come with clever ideas of how the church should be run on the earth, that is idolatry, that's, that's ungodly, that's immoral, that is anti what God expects of us. We need to go back to the throne room of grace, and that throne room of grace is given us through the medium called the Word of God under the auspices of the Holy Spirit. These are very important things. And God does challenge us, and God does confront us to critically review the way we operate. Uh, so the church is holy, and we have to get back to the book, Sola Scriptura, the word only. You can't go to something that's extra biblical. You cannot go to some lady or man that was once... Uh, a Satanist and study spiritual warfare. If they got converted, then the only thing you should know is what God gave you, not what they give you as additional information. That's extra biblical. We should not go to music or to some psychologist on how we should pump the environment for worship or how we should construct our sermons because the psychology of people are rather limited. And that's how we bring in the lights and all the peripheral things that God never ordained for the church. And unfortunately, that is the contamination of the toxic environment in which the church operates. And that's why today we have no disciples or sons of God we just have followers of popular cultural forms of Christianity. All of this is wickedness at the highest form. You can call it, you can call it a, a felt need, people-centered gospel, but that is not the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> the church is also Catholic, which means universal <clears throat> or global. That's all, not Roman Catholic. Universal or global. And the church is apostolic, which simply meant there's an authentic, original uh, uh, design that God has for the church. And irrespective of the age you live in, the design has never changed. 
that design for the church can exist in any age because it's part of the ancient of days. And the word ancient from the Hebrew must be very careful now. Olam. Olam, the word for ancient, means timeless. It does not operate from the chronologies of time. It operates from, from God. It is timeless. It is, it's, it's not contextual. It's not spatial. It's not situational. It's not based on anything that comes from the history of humankind. It comes from God himself. That's what it means. And I want to say to us, that is what we are pursuing. How do we find God's mind, God's counsel, God's heart, God's original intent? Because the present models of church are failed models. And pastors are burning out. Some are committing suicide. Uh, churches are dying. We are suffering. There's no financial breakthroughs. And we have to ask ourselves the same questions that we should always ask. Why is it that I'm trying to do all these things, but I'm not being effective or productive? Now, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. You can have COVID, you can have recessions, you can have wars, you can have all sorts of challenging situations. If you operate as a son of God, you should prosper in the midst of adversity. And I'm not a prosperity man. I just believe in the Bible. I believe that. I believe that we cannot use COVID or recessions or failed governmental systems to tell us whether we're successful or not. So going back to the book, I believe one of the things God is emphasizing, which I emphasize and everyone else that did it, had done it yesterday and today, is that we need to shift from institutional models of the faith or Christianity, traditional models, to the original way God intended the church to function. And that is that the church was supposed to function not as an institution of religion, but as the family of God in the earth, uh, in, on the earth. First Peter 2, 9 is extremely important. That God, and all those words are patriarchal, patrilineal, or familial words. That uh, if you put it that you are a chosen generation, you are a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises, which is not singing. Praises is not singing yet. That in your vocation, in your calling, in your skill set, when people study you, they should praise God. Amen. We were not created for praise. We were created to praise. Okay, let me say it again. I said it wrong. We were not created to praise. We were created for praise. Now, I like sport. I know in this country... No, I should not say this. Uh, I like sport. I like cricket. I don't know about this country. And I like soccer. And I like people like Messi. And I watch the soccer. Oh, Ronaldo. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And I have my team, and I sometimes watch these stadiums, like in South Africa, rugby and soccer and cricket, very big. And the stadiums are populated with fanatical fans, and there will be presidents and princes and rich people and educated people. And when they see their team and their players using their skill sets, praise is generated in such an exuberant way that they watch the skill of a certain player and they will lose their dignity <laughs> celebrating that person. Think about it. Think about it. 
What happened? Those players generated praise. The world was supposed to be studying us, including angels. We are the university of the heavens. They should be studying us and, and so overwhelmed by how we operate. You know, there's the way of the ant and there's the way of the bird in the sky and the way of a serpent on the rock and the way of a man with a woman. And there's the way of a son of God that brings people to their knees to say we are bamboozled with what we see in you. And that's when you take your crown and you throw it at his feet and you say, you deserve the praise, you deserve the glory, and you deserve the honor. For yours is the kingdom and the dominion and the power forever. And that's how the church was supposed to operate. Right now we're the joke in contemporary societies. Not here, I'm talking about Africa. <laughs> But the centrality is family. And it's a family at the micro level. And when we talk about it, we talk about spiritual families. And at the macro level, a holy nation made up of multiple tribes. Metaphorically, 12 tribes. 12 tribes. That's the centrality. And the whole issue of redefining family, and God's a family builder. God is not building with brick and mortar. He's not building with PA systems and musicians. God is building families in the earth. And families produce sons. Anthropologists, sociologists, people that study human behavior and the various sciences, all will, will tell us that when you have a failed family, you have failed children. This functionality can be traced right back, delinquency could be traced right back to an inoperative family culture, dysfunctional family culture. And you've seen it with Adam and Eve that when they fell out of favor with God, their sons entered into conflict, at least Cain, and there was the first murder. The first murder. So we see this culture perpetuated in the earth today. But you cannot, as we heard on the descriptions of the Hebrew and the Greek and all that was said yesterday, you cannot have family without raising fathers. This is so important. And the orphan, the independent, the individualized culture that is in the world, which is enshrined in postmodernism and existentialism, rejects fathers. And they would, for example, take a verse like Matthew 23, call no one father. Call no man father, and take it an isogeet, that scripture, out of context, and would not quote the other portion of scripture, call no one teacher, and call no one rabbi, and not understand the audit that Jesus was doing and the leadership structure of Matthew 23, the church of his day, where he was exposing an illegal, inaccurate, and misrepresented leadership. And he said, in that context, he said, call no man rabbi, call no man father, call no man teacher when we take that and we cancel it because if you really on at the literal level take that portion of scripture at the basic level then none of your children should call you father at the basic level and then Paul is a heretic because he said I am your father and he was a celibate he was unmarried then Paul is a heretic when he calls Timothy his son, and, re and he refers to, the, uh, to himself in the Corinthian sector, the sector that he gave oversight to, because Cephas, Peter, gave oversight to another group in Corinth, and Apollos gave oversight to another group in Corinth, but in 4.14, he says, 
I am your father in the Lord. You may have 10,000 teachers, but one father. Then God is a liar in contradicting the scriptures when he would tell us in Ephesians chapter 6 that you must honor your father and mother in the Lord. In the Lord. Not your natural father and mother in that context. In the Lord. That, and that did not mean that if you were saved and your parents were saved, then honor them. And if they were not saved, dishonor them. That will be social chaos in the earth. So the spirit of fathering has to be restored to the church. My humble desire would be that every pastor here transitions in his and her mindset from thinking like a pastor and start functioning now like a father. You will be surprised at what unique grace comes through fathering. The highest form of leadership in the Godhead is not creator and master of the universe. The highest form of leadership and the name of the Godhead is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Our Trinitarian view of, of, the, God, of the God we serve, the mystery of God. And to explain the mystery of God, God gives us a Christology. And the Christology is that if you embrace Christ, you embrace the Father and the Son. Go and read the epistles of John. And an antichrist, one who is opposed to Christ, rejects the Father and the Son. So when the Bible tells us in Matthew 28, which we, we, we listened to, verse 19, baptize them, immerse them in the name. It does not say in the water. Now, I believe in water baptism. I was baptized. I, I come from a Pentecostal group where they baptized you three times in water. So they put you in, in the name of the Father, take you out. The Son, take you out. Holy Spirit, hold you down. Make sure you're saved. Take you out. Now I believe in that. That's how I got baptized. And uh, if the pastor stammered, you had to pray hard. <laughs> and then I joined the Pentecostal group where we became pastors, the Full Gospel Church of God, linked to Cleveland, Tennessee. And there they held you once in the water. And they said, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if they took their time, you were really saved. <laughs> really saved. So that's how we did it then. But the point I'm making here is, God didn't say, baptize them in the name of the Father. To go and make disciples, you have to immerse them until you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in them. Yes, there's a baptism in water, there's a baptism in fire, there's a baptism in suffering, there's various baptisms. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, uh, many baptisms. But the baptism of the global missional mandate is that you disciple nations so that you can bring them back to Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image and likeness. God never deviated from Genesis 1.26. 1, the amplification of Genesis 1.26 is Matthew 28.19 and other portions of Scripture associated with it. The ultimate objective is not to win souls so that they become Christians. The ultimate objective of winning souls is to bring them back to the image and likeness of God so that the sons of God can populate the earth which we call the knowledge of the glory of God. That's the ultimate object. If you do anything else, it violates the mission that God has given to you. Now I found out that the greatest things in the ministry of the church are not taught, even though teaching is very important. They are imparted through the grace of God resident in those that 
that are given to give oversight to the church. I found that, for example, as a biological father, I've got three sons, they're all adults now, that I, most of the things they learned, they didn't learn it through me teaching it to them. They learned it to, through me becoming the message, the incarnation of the message. In other words, they learned it by my example, not by my lectures. Unless the message and the messenger becomes one, you cannot share anything. The greatest impartations takes place through creating presence rather than creating lectures. I'm not saying you don't teach. So I've never taught my kids simple things like tithing. But the more they saw the example set by us, if they saw us walk to the front to give our offerings, they started practicing it. I never taught them certain things that will take place in our home, like what kind of music they can listen to in our home. They just, the culture was so rich with the DNA of the heavenly grace that they immediately adjusted their positions to accommodate the lifestyle we gave. In other words, imitation, emu emulation, and following a very distinct example became the way that my kids grew up. I'm also finding that in my house, the church, that we are giving spiritual oversight, and I had to make a huge transition from thinking as a pastor to start thinking as a father and loving the people as if I'm loving my own biological kids. Yeah. Even though spiritual fathering is very different to natural fathering, you father people through the word of righteousness, and you don't father them in a physical way like you do your natural kids. Yeah. You have to be ever present with your family, whereas you remotely father people through the word of his grace and counsel that comes to us. And these are very important things. And I found that I stopped teaching on finance in my church. I stopped teaching. Because I learned the principle that if I'm a father and if I lead by example, then the anointing will flow from the head to the hem. I found that the more I started to live out the message, the more my people just automatically got infected with a with an infection in the environment, and they just started behaving in a certain way. And I'm not saying that you don't teach. We would teach because the early church gave themselves to the apostles' doctrine. First, the apostles' doctrine. Uh, that's instruction, didache, which is uh, mentoring, tutoring, guiding, interpreting, analyzing, transmitting. It's a very complex, it's not a tenet of faith, of, of statements. It's a complex construct of a certain lifestyle. So for me, fathering is a fundamental. You behead the father in the church, and you have a widow's house or an orphanage. And the highest form of fathering, of leadership, is not servant leadership. That's now been borrowed and stolen in the secular world. So those that are atheist or universalist or interfaith, they would talk about servant leadership. There's no such thing as servant leadership, even though Jesus washed the feet of his disciples and taught them servanthood. The highest form of leadership is to be a father who knows how to leave a double portion for his kids. Fathers serve. Paternalism is a completely different thing. It's an abuse of fathering. Where in paternalism, it's an egocentric, self, a selfish model of fathering where the children have to serve the father, but true fathers serve their children. But I'm ahead of myself, and I wanted to just speak here today very openly, very openly. One of the biggest problems in the church today is that there's absent fathers. We have too many men, but not enough fathers. And you're not a father if you produce a child. You're only a father if you know how to raise that child. 
That's why the power of adoption is so powerful in the scriptures. The power of adoption is, and according to Roman law, the, Paul borrowed this, this technical term from Roman law, and it's, you know, it's a very powerful term. In Roman law, adoption operated like this. A man, by free will and personal choice, could bring a child into his home and adopt the child legally as his child. But that law said that even if he had biological children and brought that child in, this adopted child must have the same and equal freedom as his biological kids. And whatever that adopted child has must be equal to the natural kids, and he could not prejudice or, or um, deny the adopted child the privileges of the home. That's adoption. It also said that the father can never, if he chose to adopt somebody, reject that child from his home. So the father could never deny his child, even though the law said, but the child can have the privilege of canceling his relationship with the father and leave the family. So while the father could not deny you, you as the son, the adopted son, could deny the father. And that's where your election and calling can be canceled. So he, if he elected you and chose you, he can never cancel it by the adoption law. But you can cancel it by choosing to violate the protocols, the culture, or the order of the family and go away. That's what happened in the story of the prodigal son. And if that son came back, the father could not do anything else but receive him with love. For not what he did, but for who he is. That's the salvation principle. Many of us have rejected the Father, but He has not rejected us. He sits on His stoop, His veranda, and He's waiting for us to come back. When you embrace the spirit of fathering, then we will start to see maturity coming into the house. You know, um, let me read a few pure portions of Scripture that's coming to me as I'm speaking to you prophetically. Look at Isaiah, and this is the contemporary, I'm not sure how many minutes I have. Please, just, just give me an indication. Don't tell me when it's 10 minutes, tell me when it's half an hour. <laughs> what did I say? Isaiah chapter 3. Verse 4. This is a judgment that God brought upon the church of his day that's in Jerusalem, the nation of Israel. I will give children to be, your, uh, to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. Some portions will say boy leaders. We have to ask the question today and I'm provoking us here. Have we taken grown men who behave like children and boy leaders, babies? And expect them to lead the church. I'm reading from the New King James. And people will be oppressed, everyone by another and everyone by his own neighbor. Is this happening today? The child will be insolent to, towards the elder and the base towards the honorable. When a man, this is democracy, takes hold of his brother, his sibling, in the house of his father saying, you have the clothing, the anointing, you be our ruler, let these ruins be under your power. In other words, replacing or substituting fathering with co-equal leadership. And immature leadership. Now the, the gross violation of this is that ruin, desolation, destitution will come back. 
Listen, in the Godhead, the Trinitarian, we know that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are co-equal, consubstantial, and uh, cannot in any way be differentiated from each other. We know they're co-eternal, etc. Every one of them are very God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I still got 30 minutes, praise God. <laughs> think about it, think about it with me. Okay, but in the Godhead, there's submission. The Holy Spirit submits to the Son, the Son submits to the Father, and the Father in His goodness gives everything to the Son. In the church today, we violate one of the fundamentals of becoming a leader in the church, that if you choose an elder who's a father, who's a leader of the house, not, not the Pentecostal definition of elders. Now you know the Pentecostal definition. Well, I'll give you the South African Pentecostal definition. When you find a man who is so old that you don't know what to do with him, <laughs> he's already in the departure lounge. Is about to exit. Give him the title elder. He'll hold on until he expires. That's the way we viewed elders, at least in South Africa. Elders in the Bible were the ones that led the households of God. Study Demetrius, Diotrephes, other elders. Peter was even an elder when he was operating as an overseer over family of churches, even though he was an apostle on another dimension. Paul the same. Paul the same. But one of the requirements of an elder is that you must not be insubordinate. So you have to ask yourself, who's your covering? Who are you accountable to? Who do you submit your doctrine to? Do you know that when we remove fathers from the church Satan has a legal right to establish a seat in your synagogue I can tell you let me give you an example of that because this is the problem when we go for co-equal leadership boy leadership child leadership immature men that are insecure so they never want to raise up their sons to have two times the anointing or preach better than them because they are scared they're going to lose their salary. That's the problem. I mean, go to Revelation chapter 2 with me. I'll give you a Pergamos principle here. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, I think. And to the angel of the church at Pergamos write. Now the word Pergamos means a heightened or elevated church, a church that's operating governmentally, jurisdictionally, by revelation. I mean, this church is in a high spot. And it's seven expressions of the church in, I mean, well, this is one of seven expressions of how the church as a composite operated in a region called Asia. I know your works, your employment, your calling, your purpose-driven statement, your mission, your, you know, all that stuff. Your business, etc. I know your business and where you dwell. You dwell in a governmental position. Where Satan's throne is. So how can you be governmental, apostolic, jurisdictional, let's say universal in your reach, and I also know that Satan dwells amongst you. And you hold fast to my name, so you are Christ-centered, Christocentric. So you believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You all believe in the nature. You, you believe in, in sonship. You, know, you believe in all that stuff. You hold fast to my name. And did not deny my faith. You live sola scriptura. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you're word-centered. You're not just Christ-centered. Even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed amongst you where Satan dwells. Look at this. So here's a church operating on all these levels, and then God says, 
But Satan dwells where Antipas was martyred. And the word martyred in the Greek, and I'm sure Anul can give us the amplified meaning, but one of it means exterminated, killed, or abolished. Abolished could become a legal word like you, um, you rescind a decree that was made or a position that was held. Antipas, and there's many meanings to this word, ante, against, pas, P-A-S, father, pater. It also means one who is like the father. It also means one who creates a defense system through fathering so that there will be no infiltration by satanic hordes. And this church adopted a Nicolaitan position. You can read it a little later on. You can go. Nicolaitanism was that you freed the people to make a choice on whether you want fathering or choose an opposite way of operating. And the people chose what we would today call democracy. That's when you choose your brother. Because he's got charisma. He's like Absalom in the gates of the people. Whereas a Solomon supposed to be the next. But Absalom became a pretender and usurper to the throne. He used his charismatic person personality to produce a culture where people will be lured to him. And Antipas here was the bishop, the spiritual oversight over this church. And the moment he was removed, Satan said, I have a legal right to occupy his place. And you can go on and read about Balaam and Balak. Balak was, uh, was uh, the king. Uh, I mean, uh, what's his name? Balak. Balaam and the king of Balak. Yeah, Balak. Balak was the king of Moab. And if you know the story about Mo Moab, um, just go a little further. Oh, yes, it. Who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel? Now, if you know the story of Moab, Moab is the son of Lot, born to his eldest daughter. You can read this in, I think it's Genesis 19. This girl, she said, let's become, she said to her sister, let's become surrogates of our father's seed. She said, we need to keep the lineage, but let's find a way to do it because our husbands are dead. So they got their father drunken, and they, they became impregnated with the seed from their father. And the first son's name was Moab. Again, a huge play with words here. The word Mo is a question. Who? Ab, father. Who needs a father? I just need his gift, his seed. His impartation is sperm. And it creates an incestuous position. When the spirit of father is removed, it's the spirit of Moab that steps in. And you study the, the history of Moab. It kills fathering. And two of the enemies that were not part of the seven tribes of Canaan, that still haunts the nation, of Israel is the spirit of Moab from Lot that kills fathering and then the spirit of the Ammonite and the, the father of the Ammonites was called Ben-Ami Ben-Ami which was the daughter the second the child of the second daughter of Lot Ben-Ami means uh, simply means son of my people not son of my father So when the Moabite spirit attacks you, 
we automatically start to become a people-centered culture, not a family-centered culture. Are you understanding me? And that's how we open the door to demonic activity in our churches and we ask ourselves, why is it that there's no grape on the vine? There's no bread, and, uh, bread in the house. There's no silver and gold. There's no blessings. And the principle is that when, when and you, you heard the definition of father, when a father is in the house, ab, one of the first words of the Hebrew alphabet or language, uh, uh, dictionary. Ab, the word ab is an all-embracing word that addresses every single need of the human being. The word ab, abba, means progenitor, counselor, provider, uh, one that gives you bread, counselor. Every single need you have is encompassed in this word, Abba. So when the spirit of the father comes, which is the strength of the house, actually God uses that human being as a representative, the corporeal principle that God is spirit, and for God to come into the earth, he needs a corpse through which he becomes real. Corporeal. In other words, God never does things invisibly. Even when he speaks, it will have to be through a cloud, through a mountain, through the voice of a donkey, and in most cases, through an angel or a prophet. God always looks for a man whom he sends. Whom shall, we, uh, uh, whom shall we send? Who will go for us? God always uses a man. It's called messenger. A medium. And when God wants to convey the grace that brings us to this place of not faith and hope, but perfect love, where everything is embo uh, embodied, then God has to exalt the spirit of Father. Revelation 14.1. Just put it on the board. I just want to highlight something here. In the last days, and we're living in this season now, Revelation 14.1. Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb. The principle of the Lamb is, metaphorically speaking, the principle of deputyship, substitution, replacement, and one who lives for another, the vicarious principle, one who dies. I saw a lamb standing on Mount Zion, Mount Zion, and with him, the word with means in sync with him, on frequency with him, in harmony with him, standing as if they're standing as one, standing with him 144,000. That's 12 times 12,000, the apostolic principle of 12, amplified to create a composite manifestation of apostolicity in creation. This is a Mount Zion camp comp company. 144,000 having what? Where? On the forehead. On the forehead. What is that saying? Name, nature, mindset, counsel, wisdom. I mean, the will of God, the original intent. This 144,000 was reconfigured in their mentality to operate on a level that thought like the Father. That's why when Jesus said, if you saw me, you saw my Father, Philip. I and my father one. I never do anything unless my father tells me. And whatever I do, I first study him before I practice it. And this is what we call abiding in the father and the son. That we may be one. So, it's of critical importance that this father mentality, and we're not talking about human fathers. I come from a failed generation. 
I would classify myself as an orphan who had to learn how to become streetwise by cutting my teeth in the, in the wilderness of destitution and loneliness. I mean, in my, the denomination that I come out of, uh, we've had overseers and moderators and presidents and, and superintendents, but not fathers. They ruled us by the Constitution, not by the Bible. They did not know love. They knew the Levitical order of stoning you if you made a mistake. That's where I grew up. I wish I had discovered fathering the way I've discovered it now. I'm 38 years in the ministry. And it's only in the last 15 or 17 years I stumbled. Not on the... The theology of fathering, because it's always been there, but on the revelation that became a subjective experience and it became an incarnational manifestation. And I want to say to all of us here today, don't fight this. Don't fight it because historically, most of us have, bec have encountered orphanhood and abandonment and abuse by bad leadership. Don't throw the baby with the dirty water out. If God can choose to call himself Father in, in the way he names himself, not Creator and Jesus, not as the Word, but Son. If God can choose to call himself Father, why should we not have that mentality upon our foreheads? Why should we not embrace it to operate, you know, in this dimension and anointing. Now, you know, let me close with this portion of scripture. The Bible tells us in Malachi chapter 4 that God's going to send us the spirit of Elijah. Am I correct? And to understand the, sh the spirit of Elijah, you have to study the historical Elijah and, and obviously his prodigy, who is Elisha. But one of the most powerful portions of scripture, and we can find this. Uh, I think it's in 2 Kings, 2 Kings, chapter 2. And you know, this is when Elijah is about to ascend to the heavens, and he had produced a school uh, of the prophets, and many of the, from the school became sons of the prophets. Look at the migration, school sons. Look at the ministry of Elijah. Many men living in the land... But he's, most of his ministry was to widows. So how can you be like the Shunammite? She had a husband. He was a successful businessman. Very successful. And she wanted to build an upper room for him. You know the story? Upper room. So that he would come and rest over them. And uh, the, she had to get permission from her husband to finance the building project. And yet, the Bible says, in the days of Elijah, there were, and he was an absent husband. When the son died, he was not even to be seen. Okay. Uh, and many widows like that. Uh, we know the story of Elisha. Uh, the widows uh, were, had two, the widow where two sons were going to be taken by the creditors uh, and become slaves to them because her husband left her and her sons in debt, which means these men didn't understand they can be prophets, accurate in the gift, but not in the administrations of grace. So Elijah comes now, Elijah comes to fix a problem. And um, if you went to verse, verse 11, and, and El Elisha, one of his sons, starts to tag on him. Oh, let's read from verse 9. And so it was when they had crossed over, and Elijah said to Elisha, He'll ask what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you. Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Now many people would say, that a double portion of your spirit means a double portion of your anointing, which could be correct, because historically, Elisha did two times the amount of miracles that Elijah did. That's correct. But that, I think, is an elementary explanation. Anyone who gave you a double portion in Old Covenant language 
the request for a double portion simply meant, make me the firstborn amongst your sons. It's a firstborn principle. In other words, Elisha was saying to Elijah, you have many, many sons, but who is going to be the executor to administrate your anointing and distribute it or expedite it from time to time? You can't, we can't have co-equality when it comes to administrating the mantle of your grace. So make me the firstborn. I will know how to administrate the grace. This is the same principle with Joseph having a son called Ephraim, who got a double portion of the anointing, and the son of Ephraim called Joshua would lead the people into the promised land and give them the inheritances. This is an executive administration of how you manage grace. So Elisha says to him, you know, it's, this is a difficult thing that you're asking me to do. It's like, like the sons of Zebedee. You know, their mother comes to Jesus and says, make my kids sit on your right and left hand because I want them to be the first amongst the apostles. And Jesus said, it doesn't, it doesn't happen like that. But look at this now. Look at this, and I'll close with this. So he said to him, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me, everyone say see. see. That means analyze, see beyond my flesh, uh, apprise, evaluate, estimate what I'm made up of. Don't view me as a man. If you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you, but if not, it shall not be so. If you can't work out what the composition of my grace and anointing is, you can't have what you're asking for. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire, separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now listen to this. And Elisha saw it. He caught it. He understood it. He saw it and he cried out. What did he cry out? My prophet, my prophet. This is a prophet. This is the spirit of a prophet. But what did he cry out? My father, my father, the same words Jesus cried out on the cross. The same words the Holy Spirit puts in you when you receive a Christ. The spirit of adoption that you cry out, Abba, Abba. This is a revelation. Too many people will never even get the revelation that God is their father. To operate in spiritual fathering, you have to know God is your father. And, and this is what he said, my father, my father. And then he explains the profile of fathering. He says, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more, and he took his, off his own clothes and tore them in two pieces, and he took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. This is a very powerful scripture, and we don't have time to go into the details. My time is up. Here's the point. Elisha saw the two-dimensional anointing upon Elijah. He firstly described it as a fathering anointing. That fathering anointing was over the whole nation of Israel. It was the chariot of Israel. In other words, this is the way God moved the nation from one dimension to another. This chariot was the vehicle, the instrumentality through which God established his purposes in the nation of Israel. That's why Elijah could outrun a chariot, because he was not running. He was the chariot that could overtake the chariot of Ahab. When the fathering anointing comes back, because fathers pilot, fathers direct, and I said this yesterday, you have to distinguish between the apostolic anointing and the fathering anointing. The apostolic anointing is to, is to pilot 
the purposes of God or to supervise those, uh, those purposes as a subset, as a substructure, as a foundation. But the, but the fathers open doors. Fathers give direction. God stands at the door and knocks. What's he waiting for? A father to open the door. So he can come and rearrange his furniture, his administration. The chariot anointing gives momentum. When true patriarchal fathers arise, nations will shift. The holy nation will shift. Movement will take place in the spirit. And the second thing he said, the horsemen, and some of the Bibles would say the armies of God. The armies of God. Which simply means when the fathering anointing comes, there's an army that surrounds you. And you know this with the, I think, what's it, Gehazi, um, when he was scared of the Syrian army that came. And, 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 and the prophet said, he said, open your eyes and see. And when he saw again, he didn't see the army of the Syrians, but he saw the army of God, the chariots of God, the, the, arm, the horsemen of God surrounding them. And then they realized there's an invisible barrier created, a shield created in the spirit. So when this fathering anointing comes on various levels, I can tell you, we'll see something happen in another dimension that we've not seen before. Amen. My prayer is that Trinidad will do it because I know from the little I've studied, there's an orphaned mentality here as it is in many parts of the world. And that orphan mentality is robbing us of breakthroughs and shift in the spirit and movement and security and immunity and when true fathers come back there will always be food on the table that's a characteristic of true fathering bread on the table let's shift from boy leadership to father leadership let's shift from institution forms of re uh, institutional forms of religion to the way god has chosen us to operate amen stand with me let's pray together